Okay. Welcome everyone. We're going to get going. You can take your source sheets that you have in front of you. Okay, dear friends. We are continuing our series of making the connection, building better interpersonal relationships. And today we are going to look at the story. Story time with Rabbi Hajjah. We're going to look at a story from the Torah and we're going to have many questions on this story. So follow the story carefully. I bolded some parts in the Hebrew and English so you can see what is jumping out at us, okay? But we're going to take some questions. You better follow inside. Questions are coming. And the story is all about Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu, we know, was commanded to do a mitzvah. What mitzvah did Avram Avinu have? Anyone know? Um, Brit Mila. Brit Mila is absolutely right. He has a Brit Mila. And the Torah tells us in Bereshit, Yudchet 18, that Hashem appeared to Avraham. He appeared to him. Where? In the plains of Mamre. Elohim Mamre. What, what is this? Plains of Mamre. Why do I care where this happened? Mach Batli. Anyone know who Mamre was? Mamre was one of Avraham's students and he loved Avraham. And he said, you've been given this mitzvah, a very difficult mitzvah. I want you please to come and do this mitzvah on my land. We learned from here that if you can't do a mitzvah, at least facilitate it for other people. Give them a chance to do it in your home, on your property, with your resources, with your money. So Mamre, gets a mention in the Torah, isn't that amazing? All he did was, Avram, you can put your tent and live in my land, because many of the people didn't know what Avram on their land. Why is a very good question. Maybe his good behavior made them look bad, it could be. But not Mamre. So Mamre gets a mention in the Torah, that's very nice. Avram is sitting at the entrance to his tent. Why? Why is he sitting at the entrance to his tent? This question is even, where do people usually sit? Inside the tent. The question gets even stronger because it says, it was an extremely hot day. The Torah is not weather.com. The Torah says it's a hot day. There's a reason it's a hot day. There's something we can learn from the heat of the day. So we know it's hot. We know Avram just had a Brit Milah three days before. We're told by Chazal, they're always telling us that three days after an operation, right? Maybe that's when all the adrenaline starts to die down. It's the most difficult, painful time. It's hot, really hot. And Avram is still sitting outside his tent. Why? Why is Avram sitting outside his tent? Anyone know? So Avram is Mr. Chesed and his wife Sarah is Rebetzin Chesed, although no rabbis on that day. So the pain of not having guests was worse than the pain of not, of just having his Brit Milah. And therefore he says, although I said a Brit Milah, I can't have no guests. So he sits outside his tent to look for guests. What does Hashem do? Brings it By the way, who made it hot? Hashem, God did, right? Hashem brought the problem. Why did Hashem make it hot? Rashi tells us because he didn't want to have people bothering up on the Hashem made it very, very hot. Look at that. Hashem even changes the weather for righteous people. As I said, Hashem, please, no rain today. So, no, no. so prayer, no problem. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to do that. So there is Avram Avinu. And Hashem says, no guests, but Avram has better ideas. He goes out to his tent. So what does Hashem do? I have to bring him some guests, right? He can't just change the weather. People have to change their plans. And he brings him guests. What does he see? He said, look at the words. Very careful. Every word of the Torah is teaching us something. The Yisa Enav. He lifted up his eyes. The and He saw Hine. Shloshana Shim Nitzav Malav. There were three men standing before him. The Yar. He sees them. They are rats. He runs Likratam to greet them. So he runs. Off goes Avravinu to 
Go welcome these guests. Who are these guests? Who are these guests? These three? So there's a machloket actually, right? Actually, no, they're not machloket. They were angels. They were angels in the guise of humans. There is a machloket though, an argument, whether he was aware that they were angels dressed as humans, people, or whether he was not aware. Whether he was not aware and for him, he really didn't know who they were. Why would you think he would know? Well, we know that Ravinu had angels with him the entire time. We see that even his grandson Yaakov sent Malachim, right? Actual angels to go and, you know, take care of a job for him. So they had Malachim working for him all the time. By the way, we're not so impressed with angels. I mean, I am, personally. But Judaism, right, it's like angels, right? They just have a job to do there spiritual robots. They have a tough get a job, they get the job done. They have no Yetzara. They just get the job done. Okay? So he was able to harness them. I wish he could too. And by the way, they were dressed as humans. It could be there's an angel here right now. You know what an angel? No? No is exactly what an angel would say. So I can't even trust you by saying no. Okay. So now, he goes out and he runs to them. Right, Vayarat, and every word is important. And look at it, Vayomer Adonai. He talks to the angel, says, My masters, if you have any favor, if I found any favor in your eyes, don't pass your avdech. What does avdech mean? Your servant. So he's pleading with them, he's bowing down to them, he's begging them. Avravinu was very, very famous and very, very wealthy, and yet, in order to do chesed towards another person, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. Don't think you're too big to do chesed to another person. Avravinu was very rich, very well, very successful. They see even if you have a guest come to your home, we'll discuss this later, and you have many servants working for you, you should try to do some pu'ula, some action yourself for this guest. Don't think you're too big to make a bed or offer a drink or coffee. I've been to visit great, great people, great people. And they will come to me, can I get you something to drink, something to eat, Rabbi, you know, go to the home. And they know I'm there for fundraising purposes. All right, that's enough, you know what I'm saying, to uh, be me. No, come in, you know, relax, and they're, they're wonderful. All right, and I've been to people who have many people working for them. So I was in someone's home who has 15 staff. 15 staff. Imagine that, I have a cook, cleaner, secretary in the home. That's just the home. Make no mistake, if I don't money, I also have 15 staff. I can't get my cleaner to come every day, let alone 15 staff. Okay, so he has tremendous anivut humility. He's running, he's bowing down to them. And what does he say? Yukach namat mayim. Take a little bit of water. By the way, why is he running? The Torah says he ran. Where are they going? It's a hot day. They got nowhere to go. He lives near Sodom and Amora. They welcoming guests. Why is he running? It says he's excited. Okay, he wants to get the job done. There is a statement by the rabbis, Chazal tell us, Mitzvah baliyado. When the chance to a mitzvah comes to your hand, that means comes, you're able to do a mitzvah, al tachnitzena. Don't let your mitzvah become chametz. How does a mitzvah become chametz? What is, what is chametz? What's chametz? Let, what's okay? Hello. No, 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 chametz. That's sour. No, no, no. Chametz is from Pesach, right? Chametz. You have bread versus matzah. So the rabbis say, when a chance to do mitzvot, don't let your mitzvot become chametz. But the word mitzvot is the same letters as matzot. Hmm. Interesting. Matzot, mitzvot. Don't let your mitzvot matzot become chametz. How does your mitzvot become chametz? Well, how do your matzot become chametz? They, how do they rise? You take time. They sit and they grow and they just sit. No, no, no. When it comes to mitzvot, you have a chance to do a mitzvah. Mitzvah baliado. 
אל תחתון ליום מצווה בקם חמץ, להגידון ליום מצה בקם חמץ. Get the job done, run to the מצווה. Because maybe the מצווה will not be available another time. Maybe the desire to do it, the fact that you said they run to it shows you want to do this מצווה so much. So much. So don't let your מצוות become חמץ. Don't leave them there to just rise and become full of themselves. There's also something else to say, by the way. It says, V'yar, V'yinei Shlosh Anashim, Sor, and then it says, Yivisa Ena, V'yar, he lift up his eyes and he saw the three guests. Well, why have you told me? It's all redundant, isn't it? Lift up his eyes and he saw. And he saw again. Why do I care? You don't see without lifting up your eyes. Why is that being mentioned twice? And why the different form? Is that a fair question? There's a lesson there somewhere, sisters. What do you think? Yeah. Maybe the first time he kind of like sensed their presence, and the second time he identified them as what they were. You want to say, very nice. Yeah. Say, like, you have to actively be looking, um, not just gonna like pop in front of your face. You gotta be actively looking for opportunities. The yes, there enough, he lifted up his eyes, the yar, he saw what he had to do. Many times we see things, but we don't take any action. That's two separate things. So, the yes, there enough, the yar, he saw, he had to, even in English it works. I see I should do something. I don't see, you know, you should do something. No, I see. Action needs to be taken. One of my rabbis said something beautiful. They said, when someone of the caliber of Avram Avinu, even in lifting up his eyes is worth talking about. There's such importance, even that one, a person of that caliber, even a small action like lift up your eyes means something big is about to happen. And it is. And so he goes to run to these guests and he says, you kachnat mayim. Take some water, and sit under the tree. And what's he going to do? I'll bring some bread. Really? That's it? All that schlepping? Take some bread and water and rest under the tree. A little bit. That's it. Abraham was very wealthy. What does he actually feed them? Anybody know in the end of the story? What do they end up eating? We're going to come to that in a second. He does, but he actually gives them a seven course meal. He runs to get bakar. He runs to get beautiful cattle and he gives them the best part, which is the tongue. I can't eat tongue, by the way. I don't know. I just look at it. I know people love it. It says the best part. I know the be they call it the best part with a mustard on top. Haradal, the best thing. I don't know. I can't put, I see the tongue over there. Things on top. I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I can't eat something that can lick me back. I don't know what it is. But anyway, he does that. By the way, in the schut of this mitzvah, bakar, what did he find? Did we know the Benish High says this and others. Bakar are the same letters as kever. Kuf, resh. He found the kever he was going to bury of Adam and Chava. He was going to bury his wife Sarah and himself. And eventually Yitzchak's buried there with Rivka and Yaakov and Leah. So sometimes in the merit of a mitzvah, mitzvah, goreret, mitzvah, you do one mitzvah, it leads to another mitzvah, opportunity. Okay? So because he went to the kever, the bakar, he gets the kever. Okay, fine. So, yes. Yes, in Marat HaMachpelah. Adam and Chava, right? It's called the couplings. There are four couples. So we can go there. Absolutely, you can go there. It's in Hebron. You guys love it. Of course you can go there. Sure you have like a kevel. Yeah, oh, they have a note about it. I don't have, they have Avram and Sarah, they have the other Avot and Imad, but they don't have a thing for Adam and Chava. But it's a known thing they're better over there. Avram, Avram, who chose it, because he saw that's what Avram, Adam and Chava were buried. Many Gemarot about that. Many people over history have visited there, and even the Gemara talks about seeing apparitions, seeing Eliezer in there, walking around. A lot of stuff happens there. Very, very holy place in Hebron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful place. Okay. So we know he's going to give them the most amazing meal. And yet it says, take some bread and water. It's not very good, is it? What do we learn from this? A very important principle when it comes to doing chesed. 
I'm making connection. Say little, do a lot. Say little, do a lot. Say little, do a lot. Now this is a tough question. It's not my question. Somebody is compared to Avram who said a lot but did a little. If you know this, you know your Torah. Avram Avinu is Mr. Say Little. I'll give you some bread and water. He ends up giving them a massive meal. But there's somebody else in the Torah who they say, Rashi and others say, you know what? Some people talk a lot, but they do a little. And that person is, as a story from the Torah, it's another story, they compare to Avram Avinu as the opposite. A lot of comparisons being made. Avram and Noach are compared sometimes, yeah? Or Noach and Avram. This time it's Avram and, anybody know? You may not have heard of him even. His name is... Ephron, Achiti. Ephron later on is going to say to Avram Vinu because he had Mara Machpelech. Hebron was on his land. He wanted to buy it. So Avram said, I want to buy this to bury my wife. And Eva, no, you don't have to buy it. I'll give it to you. Right? He promises him, you know, you can have it. Promises him a lot. You can take it for free. And he goes, no, I want to pay. He goes, I want to pay. Oh, no problem. Give me $10 million. Yeah? Not so nice. Ephron is promise a lot, do a little. Avram is promise a little, do a lot. That's the way to act when it comes to acting towards other people. So he runs. Look, he's running again. He runs to the tent of Sarah. Read quickly. Make for me some ugot. Ugot, okay, yeah. Are you sure? Is that what the Torah means when it says ugot? How do we know what the Torah means when it says a word? Well, we look at the English translation, but how do they know? How does Art Scroll or Feldheim or whoever's translating the Chumash know? Context and more importantly, it's called a Gezera Shava. Find the same word somewhere else, find out what it means over there, and therefore if it means that thing over there, it must mean the same thing over here because it's the same word. Right? That's what Rashi does a lot of the time. Rashi will find the same word mentioned and say, I don't know what it means over here, but if I see what it's over there, I know what it means over here. Where does the word Ugot appear? Yitziat Mitzrayim. So the Jewish people left with Ugot Matzot. Oh, modern Hebrew says cakes. But the Torah says it's Matzah. Avram Avinu is giving his guests matzah. Why? Why matzah? It says Ugot. Because it was Pesach. Huh? Ugot. It's called Lechem, but he's offering them bread, and the bread he gives them is matzah. Because on Pesach, your matzah becomes your lechem. Even then? Even then. How could that be, right? Why is Avon keeping Pesach? We weren't even in Egypt yet. That's 400 years later. Right? Let alone leaving the 210 years after that. So why is Avon celebrating Pesach? It's a great question. I'm not going to answer it. Because it's already connected to what we're saying today. But I'll give you a little answer. Okay, I'll give you the answer, but we're going to discuss it another time when we talk about Pesach. It's more about Pesach. You know the answer? It's a beautiful answer. The answer is, Pesach is not, is not an event. It's a time. A time of freedom. Zman Cherutenu. Avram Vinu was able to figure out it was Pesach time. What food you eat at that time? Matzah. Matzah. In other words, we don't, listen very carefully, we don't celebrate Pesach because the Jewish people left Egypt. The Jewish people left Egypt because it was Pesach. Hmm. We're going to shelve that. We're going to shelve that now. We're going to come back to another time. One thing's for sure, it was Pesach and he gives them. So we learn. You want to give someone food? Boom. How is matzah made? Quickly. Bread, water, no time. Don't let your mitzvot, your matzot, your mitzvot become chametz. Don't let, just like the bread has to be made quick. From, from the moment the water touches the flour, 18 minutes you got till it gets into the oven. 
right? Don't let it come. Hurry up, she's doing the same thing. So now the food itself is representing this idea in this story. Tasi Ugot Vela Bakar Rats up and he's running, he's running, he can't sit still of Ravinu. And he runs. Now there's many, many things that Avravinu did that were amazing. Many. And yet, says the Chafetz Chaim, in his book Ahavat Chesed, chapter 3, verse 2, out of all the things Avram did, he was a great scholar, he helped people, but what's amazing, the Torah devotes Pesukim after Pesukim, verse after verse, every detail, what's on the menu, his wife's involved, the Kemach, right, it's unbelievable. Why is he so involved in the story just say hey, tell me, okay we did chesed you know we learn a halachot mitzvot from one extra letter in a word one extra letter you learn a whole mitzvah from the Torah and here we have a whole story what must you say what do you have to say when you realize that very important fact huh? that chesed is more important the story of one chesed than many mitzvot in the Torah? That's what the Chovetz Chaim says. He says in Era Re'inu, we see the Torah devotes so much time and space, every detail of Avram's chesed. He kept, but well, we know that Avram kept all the laws of the Torah, he was able to. Yet it specifically focuses on the chesed of Hachnasat Orchim hospitality to guests and goes through all that detail. This serves to remind us and to inspire us to follow Avram our entire lives. That's why the Torah does not begin with mitzvot. It begins with stories of Avram, Sarah doing chesed to other people. I've mentioned this Rambam before. Let's do it again. Inside this time. Says the Rambam, this is very, if I had my way, I think I've mentioned this before, I would take this Rambam, I would print it on big cards, and I would stick it in every yeshiva and every bet Knesset, on the walls, make wallpaper out of it. I never learned this Rambam till embarrassingly late in life. It's an unbelievable Rambam. Look what he says in the laws of Tamura at the end. He says, what is the purpose of all the mitzvot? You know why I have all these mitzvot? In order to help you overcome your yetzar, your yetzar, your negative traits, and to correct your da'atov, your traits. The vast majority of the mitzvot of the Torah, enan ela etzot are advice, from the great God who is far and great. Help you become a better person. If someone says to you, what's the point of being Jewish? What are we doing over here? Why Tzedakah? Why Shemitah? Why Yom Kippur? Why Beit HaMikdash? The answer is, the Rama tells me. The mitzvah are there to help you become a nicer, better person. Which means if you're not becoming a nicer, better person, you're missing the whole point. Missing the whole point. Oh, I keep kosher. I put on tefillin. I keep Shabbat. I would never, ever only the bet hechsherim. Right? People, I get a lot of questions every single day. More than you'd believe. WhatsApp calls, messages. Is this kosher? This restaurant, I get it all the time. This hechsher. How often people call me up and say, Rabbi, how do I become a better person? I'm not seem to be getting that question. I don't know why. Not so many people. Have I, have I lose my temper lately with my wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, parents? I've become a better person. I don't get. She's annoying me. They annoying me. They want to do that to me. This person took my money. Is this kosher? Can I eat this actually? What's wrong? Who says it's not kosher? Oh, I get. I pro, I'll show you my phone after you'll see full of such messages. Okay, good. At least they're asking rabbis questions. Questions, right? And I do the same. I ask my rabbi questions too, you know? That's what Hashem wants from us. The Rambam, Chavez Chaim, Torah, it's right there. Black and white, my friends. If you're acting like an animal towards other people, you're missing the whole point of being Jewish. I'm not saying don't keep Shabbat. Right? But 
let's look at, I think it's probably one of my most favorite pieces of Torah. Big statement. This is a book we've mentioned before. I don't think we did this inside yet during this course, but I've taught it many times. This is a book written, it's weird, because we don't know who this person is. Friends, usually, we know who people are. Writers, we know who they are. They write a safe air, we know who they are, where they came from, where they live. We have some biography. In this case, we have very, very little written about this person. We know he lived in Barcelona in Spain. We know he was a Rishon, so you know, 12, 1300, something like that, you know. We know his name was Aaron, and I think we know he was a Levi as well. That's it. We don't know who he was. Weird, right? But he wrote a book. And we know why he wrote the book. He had a son who on Shabbat was messing around during the week, and his son kept asking him questions. Why, Abba, do we have to give some taka? We have to keep, uh, uh, right? So he said, you know what? For your bar mitzvah, I'm going to write you a book. Isn't that nice? And I'm going to give you the reasons for every single mitzvah. How cool is that? I'm not going to throw a big party, right? Bring in dancers and, you know, more food and cat. No! I'm going to write you a book. What a beautiful tribute to a child. And by the way, people do this. My rabbi himself is, you know, his daughter got married, he wrote a little thin book in honor of his, you know, daughter getting married or son having a bar mitzvah, beautiful thing to do. Anyway, this book is divided up into 613 sections, which makes sense because there are 613 mitzvot, right? And he does something really wild. He gives you the reason for every single mitzvah, which sometimes is pretty easy and sometimes it's really difficult. We know the reason for the mitzvah, by the way, it's not so simple just to start giving reason for mitzvah, but we'll leave that aside for another case. The Rambam does it, the Sefer Echinuch does it, Book of Education, many others steer well clear of doing such a thing. Anyway, in this book, in a couple of places that I saw, okay, and he does it by parasha, Bereshit, one or two mitzvot, Mishpatim, I don't know, 30, 40 mitzvot, whatever it is, right? He goes through, he's by in Hebrew and English. At mitzvah 16, I'm not going to tell you what the mitzvah is yet. Maybe you can guess later on. He stops discussing the mitzvah and he makes a statement. He makes a, he goes like a, a he goes to left field, as they say, and he makes the following statement. Okay, let's have a look at it and let's feed it into our discussion. Today. It's a very, very, it's a very classic concept. He mentions in a few places. This is one of them, and he says, "Let me tell you about people." He says, "Ki adam nifal kefi pulatav." That's the key statement. People are influenced by their actions. You are influenced by your actions. Now, that's a very extraordinary statement because most people are influenced by their thoughts. Right? You're upset, depressed, you sit down, someone talks to you, you go to a therapist or a rabbi or a friend or represent, and they talk to you, you feel better. He's like, yeah, maybe that's true, but people are more influenced by what they do their action, which you do is going to influence who you are. And he gives a couple of actual examples what he means. The libo, a person's heart, the whole mashrut of and all of your thoughts, tamid always, achar must have actually follow your actions. So we're all trying to feel better working on our minds and our thoughts. He's saying something unbelievable. He's saying it's the other way around. You got it the wrong way around. Don't just try to change your mind. If you want to change your mind and your attitude, Change your pool, not your actions. Because people are influenced by their actions. Imtov, vimra. Whether your actions are good or your actions are bad. Now it's getting interesting. Afilu rasha gamor. Even a very evil, terrible person. Bilvavo. In their hearts. You know those people, just mean, nasty people. Vachol yetzal machshavad libo rak rak koleyom. All they think about all day is how can I hurt people, steal from people, be nasty about people. Suddenly they have a, an awakening in their soul. And they start to change their actions. Vasakav and their actions. Right? And start to get involved in the Torah mitzvah. The Afilu Shalolosha, even if they do the actions, not for the right reasons. They do it because they want people to be nice to them, or they want recognition, or they want honor. Makes no difference. Just changing your actions is going to change your attitude. What you do, what you do is going to change. 
miyad immediately yinatel atov you're going to start to go towards the good over koch maasav because by the power of your actions yamit a yetzara your yetzara is going to be killed why yachre pulot nimshach lavavot because after your actions your hearts are going to follow and he says the other way around is that true it's got to work both ways right sisters you got a person who is a tzaddik you know those nice sweet people in school with them remember those kids in school always nice and always pleasant Adam tzaddik and just sweet people Chafetz told me they say I want to do good I want to do I want to help I want to do good you know all they do is talk about doing good all day Im Ulai if perhaps Yasok Tamid Birvam Shel Dofi they get involved in nonsense they get involved in the wrong crowd, doing the wrong things in the wrong places. Same thing, just the other way around. Yashuv lezman men lezmanem. Very soon, you'll see. Mitzedakat libol liot rasha gemor. They're going to become an evil person. Ever seen that before? You see, but you see people who go have terrible criminals and start to get involved in doing chesed. They become wonderful individuals. And people who are nice in school, they get involved in the wrong crowd. They lose it all. Kiyadu, because he says it's an obvious thing. It's no. For him, it's like a given. Hadavar ve'emet is true. Shekol adam nifal kafiru b'latav. People influenced by actions. What you do with your body, your resources, is what you become. But there's a side point. Where do you think the Sefer Chinuch, which mitzvah, is he talking about? The clue is, it's mitzvah 16. Mitzvah 16. So that's pretty early in the Torah. Pretty early in the Torah. I'll give you a clue. It's even before Matan Torah. Which mitzvah is he talking about? Anyone have a guess? Mitzvah of Pesach. Specifically, if I remember correctly, clean the, away the chametz. Why does he bring this in the Hilchot of Pesach? Because what are you doing for Pesach? You gotta buy the matzah, or make the matzah, and get rid of the chametz, and clean, and invite your parents, and you gotta shut your grandparents out of Florida, you know, air them out once a year, everyone's getting together, oh, what a balagan, he says, don't worry. Just the act of doing all these mitzvah, because a lot of actions, is gonna change who you are. If I remember correctly, he mentions this idea as well, when it comes to Sukkot. You gotta build the sukkah, and you gotta buy lulav, and a drug, and stop work, and go to Beth Knesset, and do it, oh, don't worry. It's worth it. Why? Because the actions themselves are gonna change who you are. I'm gonna tell you two stories based upon this piece of Torah. Ready for this? I don't remember if I've told these stories before. We don't think I did. If I did, I apologize. We're worth hearing it again. Story is of a man who approached the Chafetz Chaim with a question. And the question for the Chafetz Chaim was, I've been offered a job in a bank. Should I take the job? Right. Go to the rabbi to ask him whether to take a job in a bank. You would have thought, no, kosher, no. Your career, you spend a lot of your time doing that. That is something you should really consider the implications of your entire life. Not every job is a good job for every Jewish boy and girl. You gotta know what job you're getting into. Okay. So he goes, he said, open a job in a bank. And the Chavez Chaim said, it depends. It depends upon what? Which window you were offered the job in. What does that mean? So it used to be in the old days, I discovered, that they had separate windows for depositing your money and withdrawing your money. Yeah? Why? I don't know. Maybe because money was bigger than it. But they had one person who worked in the deposit. Now we have one teller that does both, right? In those days, they used to have like Basel, and you know what I'm about? And he would like a hat, right? With a thing and thing and then Right? And there'd be deposit with it. So the Chavis Chaim said, you can only take this job if you've been offered the job in the withdrawal window. If the job is in the deposit window, don't take the job. And I was like, what? what? What's the difference? I can only take the job in the withdrawal window? I, but why? I'm not giving them my money. It's not Sadaka, it's their money. And what's wrong with the deposit window? I mean, I'm just taking their money and putting it away for them. 
I'm not stealing it, Chas Shalom. He says, you're missing the whole point. You see, you got to do this job for many, many hours, many days, weeks, years. If you spend your entire day in the withdrawal window, what are you going to be doing? Giving. giving out money. You keep giving, you become a giver. But if you spend your entire day in the deposit window, we're going to be in the other day. Take you, you're going to become a taker. And we, the Jewish people, we learn from Abraham Vino, we need to be givers. Unbelievable. Isn't that an incredible piece of Torah? Not just the mitzvah, just the acts you do. You want to be a giver, you want to be a giver, boom! This is it. You got to give, give, give. You want to be a taker, you got to take, take, take. Why? Adam Nifal Kifi Pulatav. People influenced by their actions. Here's the second story, which also happens to be about the Chavis Chaim. Coincidentally, or maybe not. I've heard the story in different form. It's a short story, but I can actually say it's one of my favorite stories ever. The Chavis Chaim was on a train with his family or students. And for whatever reason, he wanted to move from one carriage to the next carriage. Yeah. And you know, it's an outdoor train, obviously, I mean, above ground. And there's those metal chunks in between that connect the trains together. And the train's moving. It's a little dangerous. Maybe people do it. So he felt he needed to do that. So he opens the door. And the train's right. And he steps into that middle section, ready to get into the next section. While he's doing that, his foot gets stuck in the metal chains, whatever, you know, that's connect them together. And the only way he can free his foot is by pulling hard. But when he does that, his shoe slips off and lands on the tracks. Gone. Immediately, he leans down, bends over, takes off his other shoe and throws off the train. And then he goes into the next compartment wearing his socks. Hmm. And his family or friends see this. And they're like, Rebbe, what was that about? We saw you lost one shoe on the tracks and gone. But why would you take your other shoe and throw it off the train? And Chavos Ham says something unbelievable. He says, you know, I was standing there with one shoe on. And I thought to myself, what am I do with one shoe? So I said, you know what? Let me take the other shoe, throw it off. So the person who finds the first shoe, at least they'll have a pair. I thought about that story many, many times. Unbelievable story. Unbelievable. And I thought to myself, you know, I could have figured that out. What are you going to do with one shoe? Hop around. Take the other shoe. And let someone else have it. Enjoy it. And then it occurred to me. It took me months to figure out that was the right thing to do. The Chavitz Chaim in a split second. One second. Because Solomon Chavitz Chaim is constantly in the world of ready to give. He's constantly thinking about the other. He's always just there on the verge of it's not me, it's about everyone else. He, didn't, he wasn't born that way. I doubt it. It took years of giving in order to give that over. There's something else in the story I want to talk about right now, which I think I mentioned over here. And we skipped it, but I want to mention it now because the next source references this. We see in the story there's Abraham and there's Sarah, but there's also somebody else mentioned in the story besides these three Malachim. Who is, what does it say is the other person mentioned in the story? Nar. And Nar is a youth. Who's that? Who's this mystery person? Why is it mentioning it? Who's he? Who cares who he is? Who's this youth that Avram Avinu is telling to go and prepare the meat? Eliezer. He does use Eliezer, but Eliezer is usually named. So it's not Eliezer. 
If it's Eliezer, we're told. We use Eliezer to go find a Shidduch for his son Yitzhak. So it would have said. Here we're told it's a Nar. A Nar, by the way, could be a young person, it could be an older person. A Nar actually is Yahushua is referred to as a Nar in reference to Moshe Rabbeinu. But over here we think it's a young person. Anyone know who it was? No, no, she's already mentioned by name. And it's a male. It's not Na'ara. No? Ishmael. Ishmael? She said it. She Very said good. Ishmael is absolutely correct. Who's Ishmael? His son. Through his wife? Oh, wait, actually, his concubine? Hagar. Hagar? Very holy, special woman. Why? Why? Uh, first of all, why does it name Ishmael? And why mention him at all? Who cares? What's he doing in the story? What do you think? How is Hagar Rui? Hmm? How is Hagar Rui and special? She was a very special woman. Avram wouldn't have chosen a wife. She came from very important royal stock, and she was very, very wealthy, and she was a famous individual, and she was willing to give all of that up. She's actually family of, of the uh, Egypt, from the royal family. She gave it up because she wanted to connect to Avram Vinu, to his chesed. And by the way, when Sarah died, he actually married, according to many opinions, he married her. He married someone called Keturah. Keturah he marries, and they say Hagar is Keturah. Keturah, that's her name. Keturah comes from Keturah. Because she was sweet like spices. Like incense. Well, no one's Jewish at this point anyway. But she she definitely was not Ovid Avar Zara, And she was Sedeka, a very special woman. Although Yishmael, well, we'll talk about Yishmael in a second. So, it refers to him. Why does it do that? We learn from it, yeah. Exactly. It's not enough just to do chesed yourself. You've got to teach it to your children. So why is that anonymous over here? You see, well, had it said Ishmael, what might you have thought? Abraham was dealing with this boy Ishmael. He's going to be a wild kid. Literally a wild kid. So it's only for Ishmael. No. It's anonymous. It's a nar. So everyone who reads the story says, Oh, I got a nar at home. I got a few. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. It was before. And by the way, he went off, but he came back many years later. And Avram didn't want to send him away. But he was starting to be a bad influence on Yitzhak. And so Sarah said, he's got to get out of the house. This is not good. This is not good. So that's what the Chavez Chaim says. It's not enough just to do good to yourself. You've got to have to sh share it and spread it. Okay? And teach your kids how to do mitzvah. And by the way, that happens very, very young. I will tell you. We're not going to finish today's packet. But I will tell you. But it's worth it. I will tell you that Rabbi Samson Felhirsch was asked. A great rabbi lived in Germany, in Frankfurt on Main. He was, you know who he is, right? He was asked, Samson Felhirsch, you're from Germany, no? Oh my God. Frankfurt is one of the leading rabbis in Germany. Torah and Derek Harris. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I let you off this time. Thank you. He was approached by a woman. She had a five-year-old son and said, when should I start giving my son a Jewish education? He said, run home, you're five years too late. Oh. Start talking to them and, like they're in your belly. Actually, that's, uh, that's what uh, Rifkan did. So we want to be like Avram Avinu. We want to do chesed towards other people. Right? And that's the whole point of this whole story. It's the whole point of this class. Right? We know it from the Gemara. The Gemara says, What do you say when you comfort a mourner? He says, Oh, terrible, our brothers who bestow kindness, the children of those who bestow kindness, and cling to the covenants of Avram Avinu. You want to do, you want to visit a mourner, a great mitzvah? Say, so, Oh, that's like Avram Avinu. So Avram Avinu's name is mentioned whenever there's forms of chesed. Avram is mentioned. So I want to be a student of Avram Avinu. So what should I do? I want to That's the question of the Mishnah. The Mishnah Pirkei says, Kol nishyesh biyado shloshet varm halalu. Whoever has these three things, Hu mital medav shal Avram Avinu. You want to be a student? How can I be a student of Avram Avinu? He died thousands of years ago. If you have these three things, you are considered a student of Avram Avinu. Sounds nice, right? What are these three things? Ayin Tova, a good eye. 
ruach nemucha, a humble demeanor, the nefesh fela, an undemanding soul. I don't know if people's soul are just like not being demanding in this society. Does that count as their soul? Or Let's have a look. Let's answer what each one of these means and try to answer that question. Let's define them first of all. And then we'll look at the opposites. But there's another comparison that's going to be made, by the way, with Avravino and somebody else. Hold on. I want to come to that question in a second. So what are these two? So the Baratanura gives his explanation. What is an Ayin Tova? He says, one who's satisfied with their possessions and don't crave the money of others. Tough. And we know Avram was like this because he fought a war against four kings. Remember the story in the Torah? And the four kings be the five kings. And they said to Ravina, you know what? You win a war, you get to keep all the stuff. He says, I don't want anything. I don't even want, and remember, a shoelace from a sandal. By the way, in the merit of that, we get the mitzvah of tefillin. Tefillin. Fascinating. I don't even want that. So we know he wasn't, he didn't crave other people's money. He was very wealthy, but even wealthy people crave other people's money. Yeah? What is this Ruach Nemucha, humble demeanor? Despite he was a very recognized, famous person, he had great humility. As we see, he says, Vanochi Afaviefer, I am dust and ashes. He was very humble. So the Mishnah brings, the covenant brings examples of Aravina stories. And the last one, an undemanding soul. Ah, this means he had control over his desires, right? And this was found because he was very, very careful how he treated his wife. He didn't abuse their relationship. He never abused anyone else. He was always careful to control his emotions and his desires. Those are the three attributes. By the way, let's look at the opposite of those three for a second. Because somebody represents the opposite of all three. Another person in the Torah. Ayin Tova. What's the opposite of Ayin Tova? Ayin Hara. Whatever Ayin Hara is, which every Sephardi woman is terrified of. I told you last week, I got two questions on that. It's the opposite of an Ayin Tova. Ayin Hara. Yeah? What's Ayin Tov? You are satisfied with what you have. You don't want what other people to have. What's Ayin Hara? You want what other people have. And you're not satisfied with what you have. It's jealousy. That's the source of it. Okay? So the person we're thinking about had an Ayin Hara. He wasn't humble. He had a big ego. And he had a very demanding soul. Right? He used his desires a lot. No, what? Bilam, very good. Very good. Bilam was a non Jewish prophet. A non Jew in the Torah. A man, a man. And he had terrible Ayin Hara. He had Surat Ayin. He was jealous. He was willing to curse the Jewish people in order to take money from Balak. Balak and Bilam. Right? They're actually two enemies who made peace in order to. He wasn't able to curse the Jewish people, ended up being a bracha. Right? But he was the opposite. So Avramavin was compared to Bilam, with the opposite of Bilam over there. Right? The Nesiva Shalom says, wow, you know, the Mishnah could just say, do chesed, do chesed, and be like Avramavin. That's what the Torah does. Just do chesed, and be like Avramavin. Instead, we're told we've got to have a Ayin Tova, Ruach Nemucha, Nefesh Vela. Why? Just say, do chesed, be a Ravinu. Obviously. Or it could just say, overcome tests, like Avram. Did Avram had 10 tests. Overcome tests, be a student of Avram It doesn't say that. It says these three things. It says, Yusham, it must be that all the qualities and all the good stuff that Avram Avinu did came from these three things. If you want to work on being good at chesed, overcoming challenges and trials, if you have these three, you got the same chance as Avram Avinu. That's the root of it. 
amazing idea, right? That's the root of it. So I want to do chesed. How do I do it? Well, just do it. Right? Who's enemy? I want to be a good person. Be a good person. But you have to work on yourself. You have to work on your jealousy issues. Difficult today. Very difficult today. Because everyone's looking at everyone else. Right? Everyone's looking at everyone else. What do they have? How come they have this? How come I don't have this? Their BMW is the five series, and mine, Rabbanu Shalom, is only the three series, and they have the big Mercedes, and the small Mercedes, and they have the better Tesla, and they have the bigger house, and the better boyfriend, and the handsome, and the hand it's very difficult. And we're all walking around, trying to be everybody else. What chance have we got of being ourselves? All right? It's a big, big problem, and we're all guilty of it. If I had eyes like that, nose like that, man like that, that could be me. This is what, unfortunately, children, our generation, are, this is the machla, the disease of our generation. This is a big problem. Not even all of that, also like how you said the actions shape like the person is and what comes of it. Yeah. If people like do all the right actions and they have good thoughts, people expect certain things now and like nothing can like things cannot make your expectations and how do we steer away from like having expectations and so tough. It's not one easy answer to that question. All I know is from the Mishnah and from what we learn in psychology if you work on yourself and if you try to become a better person you're a fighting chance if a chance maybe extremely difficult or maybe it's tough if you work on yourself very very tough it's a constant battle you have a chance not maybe I am you have a chance a chance to maybe make it happen very very difficult I'll give you a few pieces of advice. Pray. Seriously. We may do a course on prayer in the future if I am invited back. Very, very important. Surround yourself with good people. Don't show off what you have. Don't show off all the stuff that you have. Don't ever do it. I know it's difficult, right? Someone gets engaged, right? They want to be on social media, the ring, and that. I don't like it. I don't, I don't like it. I, got, I, I also say Mazal Tov. I don't, you know. I, you know. You've got to be very, very careful today. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not saying you should. I'm involved in it too. I'm on social media, you know. I use it for classes, to rock, connecting to people, you know. But showing off what you have, you got to be careful. My oldest daughter will never let me post. If I post one picture of the family, it goes crazy. Kavala's man. She shakes me. Oh my God. And she doesn't have a smile. And she goes, my wife's and looks and goes, you've got a picture of me too. You better get it off. Okay. Um, you were saying before how that guy said um, you're influenced by your actions. That's the uh, Sefer Chinuch says that, yes. So, Sefer Chinuch said that. Um, so, like, do you, do you believe that, like, let's say you're praying with zero kavana, should you keep doing it? Do what? You're praying with zero kavana. With deer? Zero kavana. Zero? Yes, still, oh, yeah. You should still About do it. A thousand percent. Even go to shul so that we can see you as well going to Bet Knesset. Oh, really? Sure. Is it the best? No. It's not a, it's not, there's not one finish line. There's better ways to do things. Absolutely. Right? The Torah tells us. The Chazal tells us very, very good. It's not me speaking. So the person comes to Lord Shema, Lord Shema eventually will do it for the right reason. Right? It's better to give Siddhaka so you have your name on the wall. Look on my family. Look how rich I am. Better do that. Actually, you should put your name on the wall. I don't like anonymous. Why? It inspires other people to give. But if a person gives only because they want to have kavod, it's going to exist. Still worth it. Absolutely. Still getting the job done. All right. Thousand percent. Thousand percent. Is there a better way to do it? Yeah, but most of us are human, right? We give, we want to be recognized, you know, we have that desire. Everyone does. I look who they are. I mean, I know people give away tens of billions of dollars and don't expect much of recognition from it, but uh, that's the way it is. Okay. Uh, everyone's still going over here. It's a long class over here. A little bit more. If you need to leave, you can go right ahead. I've, I've overrun my time. 
So there's another mitzvah in the Torah, and it says, You should follow God. You should fear God. It's in Devarim, Deuteronomy, Yud Gimel Hey, 13.5. That mitzvah tav you should keep his mitzvot. You should stick and glue yourself. Devek is money, but it's cleave to Hashem. Well, how do I do that? How am I to come close to Hashem? The Gemara asks that question and says, you know what? If you act like Hashem, you're following this mitzvah. Hashem clothes the naked. He put clothes on Adam Rishon. God visits the sick. He visited Avravino after the Brit Milah. He comforts mourners. Right? When Avram, after Avram died, he went to visit Yitzhak. He buries the dead, put Moshe Rabbeinu in the ground. Hashem did these things, and it's spoken in the Torah, so you can know how to be. So how do you be like God? It says, be like God. How? Do what God does. What does God do? He does nice things. He does nice things. Look at the nice things and follow that. He does some difficult things too. Right? He bought my ball. Don't do that. Follow the nice things. Try to follow his Mida Rachamim. And that's how you can be like God. Okay. We've done almost an hour. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Fantastic. Okay, so next week there is no class. Is that right? Oh, there is class. I'm going to check right now. Check right now. And I'm away the week before Thanksgiving. I have to go to visit my parents, Bizrach Hashem in London. Oh, I've not seen them since 2019. Wow. Wow, congratulations. And I see them every day on FaceTime, but... So that is, the next week is that class? There's class next week, there's no class the week after. Ah, so next week there is class, week after that, no. Week after that, no. So next week. Right. I'll be away in two weeks, but there will be class, other classes going on. We won't be there. There's no class. Oh, why not?